Colleagues, welcome back to the office. It's Steve. Colleagues, welcome back to the office. It's Steve and welcome to the CPE Today podcast. We're going to get started with our podcast presentation here just in a moment. But before we do, I'd like to share some insight on how you can receive credit for watching today's presentation. There are two options. You can either watch live as it's being recorded through Zoom, more on that here in a moment, or you could be watching or listening on demand wherever you happen to receive content. We distribute our show through YouTube, SoundCloud, Facebook, our website, and many other places. Now, if you happen to be watching on demand on your own schedule. After watching or listening to today's class, head on over to cpetoday.com and locate today's course page. Uh, you can find our course code by looking at the footer of the presentation to see the link presented there, and it will also be mentioned throughout the presentation on multiple occasions. After com purchasing today's class, you'll complete a short five question quiz on what was discussed in today's presentation. And upon passing that your certificate for your CPE credits will be automatically generated and available for download. In addition to your purchase, you can also download copies of today's presentation, learning materials. You can ask the presenter questions and more. Now, if you happen to be watching live as it's being recorded through Zoom, your attendance will be confirmed through attendance prompts, which will occur every 12 to 20 minutes and approximately four per hour. They'll pop up automatically. And when a prompt comes up, please choose a response to confirm your attendance. It doesn't actually matter what you choose as long as you choose something as your response will confirm your engagement with our presentation. Attendance prompts might not be announced, so please keep an eye out for them. Now, as long as you've com uh, completed at least 75% of the attendance prompts, you will receive full credit for our presentation. Your completion certificate will be delivered to you by email within two business days of the event. You can always visit cpetoday.com if you have any questions or issues with your certificate. After our presentation today, we'd love to know what you think. Uh, there will be a course evaluation that will automatically pop up. It should take you anywhere from one to three minutes to complete, and your feedback will be used to help us produce better content in the future. Now, if you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, we'd love to know what they are. Please use the chat or the Q&A functionality to let us know what you think, or if you have any questions on the materials that are being presented. Also, please feel free to share your experience, knowledge, and insight with the class. If you have any technical issues, you can also use that functionality to ask for help. You can always find great content at cpetoday.com. We have a variety of self-study and live courses from all topics, accounting, audit, personal development, Excel, QuickBooks, and more, you name it. Check out cpetoday.com. And the CPE Today podcast is made available Tuesdays and Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific. And you can always find great content being discussed in that podcast every single week. If you happen to be a new user, listener, viewer of the CPE Today podcast, thank you so much for coming. Welcome. We're ecstatic and happy to have you. How about you get a free credit on us? Use coupon code ONEFREEPODCAST at checkout to get a free credit for today's class. We're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation here in the podcast today. Thank you so much for being here and enjoy our presentation. All right, folks, let's go ahead and in our next section here, start to take a look at how blockchain and uh, public blockchains specifically, sorry, not public blockchains, private blockchains specifically can be utilized inside of an organization to accomplish various technological uh, needs. You know, blockchains in particular, they offer that ability to be immutable, permanent, uh, great for tracking, offer great transparency, and different organizations are utilizing blockchain in different ways to bring these benefits to different projects that they are working on, okay? So one of the beautiful things about a private blockchain is that you get all the benefits of blockchain technology without having to deal with some of the unnecessary components of a public blockchain like the Bitcoin, uh, specifically the valuation that is constantly fluctuating or changing. You know, a lot of these private blockchains have no need for something to be uh, either publicly available or traded on a uh, public blockchain. So why incur that to begin with, okay? And so uh, most of these technologies as we're gonna talk about today are actually utilizing open source tech. Uh, specifically, there's two major ones that are out there. There's Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Bisu, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
um, that are powering kind of some of the really interesting case studies uh, that are out there for some of these uh, uh, internal projects and, and uh, kind of pilot projects being done by these different organizations. Now, uh, we've got several that we're going to go ahead and talk through here. Um, and first, what we're going to start off with is taking a look at how the Italian post office uh, is utilizing uh, customer loyalty points calculation. Um, you know, in Italy, the post office is very integral to many different aspects of their economy. It's more than just a post office. And uh, they offer loyalty points very similar to maybe how you'd see with like Amazon points or your grocery store similarly. Uh, but their loyalty points can be used across uh, different businesses as well. And they're using blockchain to publicly uh, track this information, um, you know, in a way that's transparent and, and uh, provides uh, insight to customers on exactly how their points are being calculated and used. Uh, another really good example of this is uh, in the logistics networks for the food supply chain. Uh, traditionally, supply chain networks for food have been quite difficult. Um, you know, here in the United States, it's only required for in almost all cases to only have one level up and one level down of tracing within your supply chain for food. Uh, and that's actually quite difficult to be able to, you know, kind of trace the providence of something in the event of like an outbreak of some sort. Uh, you know, think of like E. coli outbreaks or salmonella outbreaks. Often uh, we end up throwing away a lot more food than we really need to uh, because it is spoiled for one reason or the other uh, or infected with, uh, you know, some sort of uh, bacteria. And it's ultimately, we can't determine where that food came from and who it was sold to. Well, uh, Walmart, in conjunction with their partners, including Dole, Driscoll, Tyson, and others, have put together a, um, a pilot project to track the provenance of the, of the food that they're selling, you know, pretty much from farm to table. And we'll talk about how they're utilizing uh, that there. Uh, Maersk, one of the largest shipping providers uh, around the world, you know, they've got their big ships that they uh, send containers and cargo all over. Uh, they have a pilot project utilizing um, blockchain to track the logistics network. Um, you know, they found that, uh, you know, shipping even a simple container, uh, you know, not even a long distance, the number of people, organizations, government entities, and more that are involved in that. Uh, it's quite a lot. And, uh, you know, they're looking at utilizing supply chain as a better, more transparent way of, you know, tracking these containers inside their network. And beyond that, you know, think about like international shipping. Um, you know, you often, when you send a container, have to clear customs. Uh, blockchain can provide some really kind of unique uh, security and verifiable uh, information with related to these uh, containers. Um, where there could be a high degree of trust that maybe even, for example, customs can rely on that information more so than like the internal company database. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And IBM, uh, which is actually one of the companies behind um, the Hyperledger Fabric and Viso products, uh, they've actually got some pretty interesting case studies as well, uh, including one such case study that is uh, utilizing a process using blockchain to standardize and onboard their new vendors inside of um, their supply chain, you know? So if you're gonna go to work for IBM, you know, often there's specific uh, specific vendor requirements and supplier requirements to work for them. Uh, this is a methodology that they're following uh, to standardize that process and again, provide that kind of insight and, uh, and transparency into that process. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, these case studies and try to figure out some practical examples of where blockchain technology might be effective for your company. So our first case study is going to be the Italian post office, right? So the Italian post office, and I'm not even going to attempt to say this in Italian and embarrass myself here. Uh, it's one of the oldest established organizations inside the country. And it's been around, you know, in various iterations, probably going back all the way to the Roman era. And, you know, they do more than just deliver mail. Uh, obviously, that's one of the big notable things of what they do. Uh, but uh, it does more than just that. It's also an, actually an online marketplace. Uh, and the Italian post office offers the citizens of Italy and the people who are in Italy uh, financial products and services. And that's actually quite common throughout Europe, even in Germany. Um, you know, the Deutsche Post uh, is, you know, it's a community landmark in a lot of respects. There's a lot of stuff like that that post office provides uh, both in Germany as well as here in Italy, that uh, is beyond just the needs of, of delivering mail or packages. Uh, this is where you can go. You can set up a bank account. They've got insurance services. They can do online payments uh, to people, money transfers, and things of this nature. 
and it's been around forever. You know, um, in the modern version here, it's been around 158 years. It's got over uh, 12,000 post offices in Italy, workforce of over 100,000, financial assets of a half a trillion dollars, 35 million customers. Uh, I mean, it's been a focal point and in the middle of Italian commerce for forever. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, they have a program here to track the loyalty points, you know, as most businesses, you know, they're looking for ways to engage and keep their existing customers in play and uh, engage with them and purchasing more and, and doing more. And so one of the best ways of handling that is kind of through these loyalty programs. Um, you know, I could say for myself, I'm, a, um, you know, pre COVID, I traveled a lot more than I do now, but you know, um, when I do travel, I pretty much only travel on Delta. I only stay in Hilton properties. Why? Because I've got so many points with both of those companies that, uh, you know, frankly, it, uh, you know, I could treat it like a prince. So, you know, why, why not stay there? And so these loyalty programs, though, I mean, they could be a lot of information to track, especially as you start to look at how they're utilized beyond just that one company. And uh, uh, obviously you want to bring transparency to all parties involved, partners, customers. You need it needs to be incredibly reliable. Um it, it's more than just kind of a simple database and a ledger of, you know, how many points somebody has. You need to be able to track where those points are incurred, how they're, you know, what type of points there are, when they're redeemed, so on and so forth. In the, uh, in the case of like Delta, as an example, um, I mean, it's a, it's a line item on their financial statements, if I believe, you know, it's as a, I would assume some sort of a liability because, you know, when you incur these points, you know, they owe you services in some way in the future, you know, so it's important to be accurate here. So the Italian Post, though, they are uh, letting their customers combine points from different programs uh, inside of a single loyalty point. So think about, you know, not just the Italian Post Office, but grocery stores and other retailers where you can go and you can spend money, okay, and you can maybe earn points there. Well, the Italian Post Office is allowing for those points to be, let's call, let's say pooled and calculated into one central place. Uh, really what their intention here is, is to make this very easy and approachable and very customer uh, centric for the folks that are uh, using this program. Okay. And so, you know, what they decided ultimately here was to utilize blockchain to be able to track this information. Uh, the reason being that it's, think of it as more as like a consortium of different organizations led by the post office here. Um, but because of this nature of, of blockchain being decentralized and distributed, uh, what they were allowed and what they kind of set up here, which is pretty cool, is that each partner utilizing this kind of like uh, this loyalty decentralized blockchain has their own little node. OK, and if, uh, you know, they want to be able to set up their own loyalty points rather than doing it from scratch, they can join this kind of like, let's say, um, group and you could be able to offer those loyalty services without having to incur all of the headache and work to get this set up for yourselves. OK, and so if a partner doesn't have the technical or financial capabilities or interest in doing this, the Italian post office can provide that node um, to that to that potential new retailer and they'll manage um all the technical aspects of this. Okay. And without the uh, blockchain's digital ledger structure, a loyalty program um, typically reconciles periodically, you know, so every, you know, month, six months, maybe every year, uh, you know, somebody I'm assuming back in uh, Rome would uh, essentially calculate this and kind of, you know, post the current balances. Um, most loyalty programs are like that. I know for like Delta, for example, they recalculate at the end of the year and it rolls over into the next calendar period. And uh, in this particular instance, uh, because they're using blockchain and because the different nodes are interconnected with each other, they uh, allow for um, kind of immediate real time tracking and uh, the ability for a consumer to be able to immediately know where they stand across all these different retailers. And so because it's decentralized and because it is uh, uh, integrated with all these different companies, you know, it becomes really simple for a customer to be able to engage uh, and it makes it better for everybody. Okay. So customers can easily access their accounts and rewards. They have a mobile app, um, and the mobile app can come from the post office as well as partners can set up their own uh, mobile apps and allow customers to be able to connect their account to that. Okay. And after accepting the terms and conditions, a new wallet is generated, uh, it, that would represent basically that consumer's location in that blockchain. And, you know, they've incentivized this so that, you know, kind of once you've signed up for their loyalty programs here, you get a welcome bonus. You could start exploring 
the multi-branded workplace. So you could see deals from the post office and maybe other major retailers in, in Italy uh, that are participating here. Okay. Now, every time I go to buy something though, okay, when I go to use my rewards, it's creating a voucher that's going to combine those different programs together. And then I could use rewards generated from one program and another merchant if I wanted to. And so, you know, I, I buy stuff, let's say from a, a supermarket and I get X number of points for that purchase. Those points would get stored in my digital wallet. And then I could go redeem those points at that supermarket or another vendor that is choosing to participate. And so it's actually utilizing blockchain in three ways. Uh, it's using digital wallets for consumers to be able to hold their points and records. Uh, it's using tokens, which are the uh, points that are being generated here. And then ultimately smart contracts between these different merchants and providers and consumers to kind of provide that degree of trust where information um, you know, is securely uh, stored in the blockchain. And as long as the conditions are met, that contract will execute. Now that sounds like a lot and frank, frankly it is. It's probably a little bit easier to visualize this. And uh, let's go ahead and just take a look at what this looks like uh, with respect to uh, how that visualization occurs here. And what we could see here with respect to this is that, you know, we've got multiple layers of this that are kind of set up. Uh, and with respect to this, you know, we can kind of see that um, we've got our wallets, we've got our tokens, we've got our smart contracts, uh, you know, that are all kind of in, in serving various different needs with respect to our, uh, our organizational uh, uh, work here, you know, so the wallets, for example, are providing that single access to all the different programs that are carried out. Uh, the wallet is what the consumer is going to have. That's where they're going to see their particular, uh, their points and, and basically the transaction history for uh, the different things that are incurred. Okay. We've got those tokens. The tokens represent the digital assets like those points, the vouchers, um, gift cards, things of this nature that represent some sort of value. Those are tokenized assets stored in that user's wallet that they could then pull out and use whenever that they want. Okay. And then you've got smart contracts. The smart contracts make it possible to set up rules that allow the program to be able to operate. And so tokens can be utilized across the network between merchants, uh, even potentially, for example, uh, given to other people, you know, so you incur it and you could trade it or uh, transfer it to somebody else, uh, that token, and they would get the rights that, that you were granted. Okay. And so this is built on the blockchain because it allows ultimately every partner to maintain their own ledger uh, within a common framework. They have their own um, kind of independence, but they're interdependent at the same time with each other uh, because ultimately it's the same program. And, and, because it's the same program, there's obviously some common things that have to occur between these different merchants, between these different organizations with each other. But, you know, they've got standards essentially that allow that to occur. We've got a common playing field uh, that we all can choose to participate in. Okay. And so what do we get out of this? Well, it's decentralized. No one merchant's responsible for the outcome of this program, although it is definitely being led by the Italian post office. Um, the facilitation of this, let's say the, uh, the, um, the nature of the data, it's not all just centralized with them. It's available to other parties as well. Uh, the users get traceability. We could see how these transactions occurred. We have a high degree of trust, uh, and transparency because we have uh, the insight necessary to see how these transactions occurred. And because it's in blockchain, we know that, uh, there can't be some just kind of, uh, uni you know, kind of unilateral, change of um, the data or some sort of prior period uh, correction here, because again, once a transaction is added to blockchain, it's there forever. Okay. And so kind of, it's a win-win for everybody. Now, if we look at this a little bit more technically here, and uh, we see this from a little bit more of a, a piece by piece, you know, this kind of gives you a technical background of how these different products uh, kind of come together. And uh, frankly, we've got a lot of moving pieces here from mobile apps, point of sale terminal, uh, app for mobile merchants, you know, that are maybe out and uh, doing stuff in streets, maybe not in a traditional storefront. Okay. And then uh, we could see over here, some of the different pieces that are occurring, you know, within the Italian post office and how these different uh, components come together. Uh, and frankly, you know, this is a lot, you know, in terms of being able to, uh, to uh, incorporate, but we can see there's elements of things like smart contracts. Uh, we can see that there's uh, different parties involved at different parts of this, uh, of this puzzle. Now, this is in the benefit of everybody. We all kind of end up with a better product. 
uh, merchants be able to offer better products and better uh, programs to their consumers. Consumers get uh, that insight and it's a win-win for everybody. So the post office here, they're using that Hyperledger BSU product to, for, uh, to facilitate their projects, their projects. And from the partner's perspective, uh, they each kind of get their own independence, what kind of programs, loyalty points, you know, who they want to be allow for interaction with, how their different points can be used, perhaps with different men, uh, different vendors and the like. But they don't have to take on the whole big headache here of kind of having the facilitation of this entire project. Uh, they just have to handle, uh, they just get to, to handle their one single piece of the pie. For the consumer side, that mobile wallet improves experience, but they got a single point of access to all the different programs carried out, uh, re regardless of who's participating on the platform. Okay, Technology delivers data in real time, leads to better access to rewards, and ultimately a better consumer experience. And everything is interoperable. Each loyalty point, regardless of the program it was earned, is represented in the same form. So you have different types of tokens, but the uh, structure of those tokens in terms of how they are generated and how they are used, well, guess what? Those are all the same. And with respect to that, uh, they all look the same. They just have different uh, specific purposes. You know, and probably the best way I can think of it here in the United States, which which might be kind of similar, would be like uh, my Apple wallet on my uh, on my phone here. You know, so I got my my Apple wallet and it has all my different credit cards and loyalty points. And, you know, I could pick, for example, my Amex or I could pick my, my Visa card. But then buy, on top of that, too, you know, I've also got other stuff. I've got like, you know, for example, like my Delta card here. I've got even my vaccination card, uh, my Starbucks card and uh, even concert tickets. You know, I've got even concert tickets from older, uh, older programs. But I actually really like Apple Pay for this exact reason. You know, um, I typically when I go on the road, you know, um, I don't carry every single credit card with me, but I have access to all of those credit cards right here on my phone. And uh, I think it's kind of similar in that respect. So Apple Wallet is its own thing. You know, it's a service provided by Apple Wallet, Apple in this case. And I mean, there's an equivalent for Android as well. But we're not having to, uh, you know, each version, you know, Visa, American Express hasn't, ha isn't having to come up with their own way of handling this. And it's better for the consumer because now we have just one place for all of this data to go. So I think this is awesome. And the fact that they're using the blockchain makes it very trustworthy and transparent and you know it's ultimately going to provide a better experience for all parties involved let's go ahead and take a look at our next example here and this is going to be utilizing um logistics networks and tracking food as it moves from farm or ranch to your table now as i mentioned tracking food is actually quite difficult by its very nature you can't serial number a head of lettuce easily you know maybe you could put a band around it that's got a serial number. But uh, usually this stuff is in batches, it's in bins. Um, we're using bulk materials in most instances here. And, and frankly, it could be quite difficult. And food traditionally has moved through a very uh, fragmented logistics network here that has always been very paper driven. Um, even though parts of it are digitized, most of the time there's not really kind of good interoperability or data sharing between these different systems. Now, the FDA does have some requirements with respect to these different farms, wholesalers, and retailers being able to track things uh, as they are being sold. However, it only requires one step forward and one step backward. So if I was a wholesaler, I need to know where I bought this head of lettuce. Uh, if I bought it from a farm, where it, what that farm was, and I need to know who I sold it to. You know, So I would need to know, for example, um, you know, what, what grocer I had sold it to. But it's a many to many type uh, relationship. I'm not usually selling lettuce from one farm, but many farms and they all look the same, you know, especially if they're all Romaine or iceberg. I mean, does it really matter? And that can be very difficult to be able to track. And likewise, uh, stores are often selling, buying from multiple wholesalers because due to the nature of food, some things aren't in season. It's from parts of the world and you got to buy from different suppliers if you want to keep, you know, your lettuce in stock when it's the middle of winter and you're in North Dakota. Okay, so when a contamination occurs, though, what the FDA wants to do is they obviously want to be able to track down the affected people and tell them to throw away that lettuce, you know, and uh, there have been plenty of examples. Most recently, I would say probably 2021 was probably the one I'm thinking of here. Uh, 53 people in 16 states got an, infected by E. coli. 
And uh, it ultimately came from romaine lettuce. And what ended up happening is they tried to trace the providence to figure out, because it was in 16 different states, where the heck did this come from? It probably only came from one or two places, maybe even one or two farms here. But when we talk about big retailers like Safeway, Costco, and I'm not saying they purposely sell anything like that. I'm just saying if you're Costco, you're buying food from everybody. If you're Safeway or Kroger, you're buying food from everybody. It can be really difficult to be able to trace here. And ultimately, in this particular instance that I'm remembering here, uh, they couldn't identify a single supplier or location. And then they ended up recommending to all consumers to throw away that food, which obviously is a tremendous waste. And it's probably only 1% of affected product. But if you can't trace it, you got to err on the side of caution. So enter blockchain. Walmart, in conjunction with uh, nine of their larger uh, food uh, retailing companies, including Dole, Driscoll, Tyson, Nestle, Unilever, and others, uh, decided to put together a blockchain product uh, and a pilot project to see if maybe blockchain could help with the uh, tracking of the provenance of, uh, of food. Okay. And so they ended up connecting two different tests, one on mangoes here in the United States, another one on pork in China. And they chose the blockchain product Hyperledger Fabric, uh, which is an open source commonly used blockchain product. Uh, it used to be 100% produced by IBM, but they've since, I believe, donated the source code to the Linux Foundation, and now it's open source. And anybody can use it. Okay, now what they did, though, is they created a private permissioned blockchain where they are the ones that are controlling who can participate. And they created six character lot numbers that they assigned to the different products that were uh, being produced and tracked. Okay. Now this system is accessible by any Walmart employee at any computer. They type in a lot number and it will trace the providence of that food. Now here's where it starts to get really use, interesting and very useful. So they did these two different projects. Okay. Now previously, uh, when Walmart wanted to track the um, providence of, of like food, it would take a pretty long time to be able to do so. Uh, previously, in one example, it took six days, 18 hours and 26 minutes to track the, uh, like a pack of mangoes back to what farm it had come from. Well, because, and I'm assuming it's not just with respect to the lot numbers and the blockchain product, but also kind of improvements to their logistics networks at all, that prod, that uh, tracking went from seven days down to seconds, you know, instant. Uh, because again, that's how fast this information can, can move. And we know here because it's blockchain based, it's immutable, it's permanent, we can rely on the information presented in this system. They did a similar test in China, testing uh, pork bellies here, and they pretty much got the exact same results, 100% accuracy tracing pork back to its origin uh, to whatever farm they needed. Now, the way this worked was that Walmart employees would enter in a six-digit lot number that would appear on the actual product that they were selling. It would say like lot number one, two, three, four, five, six. They plugged that into the system, and the system would then spit back information about that particular product, where it came from, how it was created, and then pretty much every step along the way. The idea with the blockchain side of this is that all the different merchants, wholesalers, farms, um, you know, freight carriers and the like are pretty much writing information on the blockchain at every step of the way as that uh, product moves from the farm all the way up to, um, you know, the table. So you'd scan it in and it would tell you what it is. So it'd say something like, hey, these are mangoes. They're the Tommy variety. And it would have a timestamp of everything that occurred with respect to that particular product. So it was harvested on April 24th in Osaka, Mexico. On the 25th, it went through a hot water treatment to uh, sanitize the product. On the 27th, it was imported. Okay, it passed a uh, border inspection on the 29th. Okay, then it went into a facility on May 1st where it was cut, sliced, and packaged and made available for retail sales. So what did blockchain allow to happen here? Okay, well, in this particular instance, technology running grocery stores in 2022 is remarkably like the technology we were using in the 50s and probably even before then. You know, it's gotten a little bit better. We got point of sale now and you can use a credit card. But, you know, on the back end of this, they're still pretty old school. You know, you figure out how many to buy, you find a wholesaler, they sell it to you, they deliver it, you put it on the shelf, you sell it. Well, blockchain here kind of is helping improve this logistics network and improving the grocery supply chain, okay? Now, for a grocery store, your average grocery store, 
uh, 50,000 items. You know, if you think about it, that's not that hard to get up to, you know, think about just ketchup, you know, they've got 20 brands of ketchup and every possible size from, you know, the little tiny ketchup packets all the way up to, uh, the big bottles, you know, you can get to that 50,000 SKUs pretty quickly. Um, and managing that vast quantity of information, blockchain is going to be much more capable. Okay. Where I think this really kind of kicks in though, is really kind of in this management of the different relationships in the supply chain. A lot of many to many relationships here in the grocery business, lots of suppliers buy from lots of farms, farms sell to lots of suppliers. Plus maybe they got a little road stop you can pick up and, you know, buy directly from them as well. And, you know, retailers buy from a lot of different places. Um, you know, there could be strategic relationships. Sure. You know, that, that does happen when you maybe get everything from one supplier, but in grocery stores, that's very, uh, uncommon just due to the seasonality of uh, certain fruit, you might buy strawberries, uh, let's just say, you know, April through September from a, a retailer or a, a farm in California. But you know, when it gets a little too cold, maybe you have to end up buying it from a farm in Chile or something when it goes into those winter months. And again, there's lots of people that are involved in that process. Okay. Future omni-channel supply chains where people will purchase any type of produce from anywhere in the world and having it delivered to their door. What this really kind of speaks to is the fact that we've got all now beyond this, uh, these delivery services like DoorDash and uh, Uber Eats and uh, um, I'm blanking on some of the other ones here, but I'm sure you're, you can think of maybe the one that you, your family uses here, um, Grubhub and others, you know, where, uh, you know, the store itself might become even less important. Uh, I know at least for my family during COVID, we were having our groceries delivered and sometimes it would be from Safeway and some of the time it would be from Stata Brothers. It just depended. And so, you know, supply chain could even become more um, diluted here in the very near future. Let's go ahead and talk about our next example of private blockchain. And this is going to be also a logistics network. And this is, I personally feel that like, Blockchain and logistics really do go hand in hand with each other. Uh, and in this, you know, and they just, this, I think that the technology between, um, the technology really kind of complements uh, logistics well in that traceability. And then also that, uh, um, you know, kind of also having that kind of transparency into tracking things. You know, it just, it just works really well. And, and um, you know, here in the United States, you know, we're, we're, we're really everywhere now. I mean, it's in a global economy. It's very common to be buying and selling to people all over the world and, and being able to have really good insight into items as they're moving through the supply chain, I think is going to be a big benefit to us all. Uh, so Maersk, which is one of the largest logistics companies and they run shipping, uh, they've got ships and container ships and bulk carriers all over the world. Uh, moving stuff from port to port, you know, if I need to get something on a boat, you know, to London, you know, I'm going to call them, they'll pick up the container and get it on a boat and get it sent wherever it needs to go. I, as the shipper or you as the customer, maybe want to be able to track the container and just know that uh, it's being handled properly and flowing through the proper chain of command and customs and everything else kind of along with it. And so they did a uh, pilot project here where they were tracking uh, containers, um, as they move from port to port. And so what they found was that a single container, in this case, it was coming from Kenya in Africa to Rotterdam in Europe and in, in the Netherlands, that, uh, 30 different organizations and a hundred different people were involved in touching that specific container. And it's incredible. I mean, think about like, again, like if you were to ship something, somebody's going to come pick it up in your office. It could go to a, a yard of some sort, you know, that gets picked up by another person. They take it to another yard and then ultimately makes it way its way to the docks. It could pass through multiple different uh, ships, potentially multiple different yards, potentially. And, uh, before it ends up where it's supposed to go. Okay. And what they found is there are 200 elements of information uh, that were essentially exchanged that were all through paper systems uh, in this traditional kind of uh, shipping example. So they did a project with the Hyperledger Fabric product uh, to determine if something in blockchain could make this uh, easier, faster, and better. And so they did this project in conjunction with DuPont, Dow Chemical, and other companies as well, including also some federal agencies uh, here in the United States, U.S. Customs and as well as uh, in the Netherlands, they had the Netherlands customs as well as the port of Rotterdam. And they created a project with, which will allow for these containers to be able to not only be tracked as they move 
uh, and then have that information written out to a blockchain that would then be public and checkable. Uh, but it also allowed for certain critical information to pass to the necessary agencies that would need to know about this. Uh, in this particular, uh, in this particular example, you know, like the bill of lading and custom documentation could electronically and securely and verifiably be transmitted to this case, to the port of Rotterdam, as well as the Netherlands customs and be checked and verified, uh, before that port, uh, before that, um, container ships ever pulls into port again, pretty cool with respect to what they could do here. And that helped speed up this actual process of clearing customs and ultimately, uh, it proved to get products into the hands of consumers and pastors. Here's another example of private blockchain. This is with IBM, and this is using a product um, with a company called, the, the company is called Chainyard, okay? And really what they're trying to do here is to get all the necessary documents together to approve a vendor for somebody to do business with. And in this particular case, they're working with IBM. And if you think of a vendor like IBM, I mean, they're huge and they've obviously got a lot of red tape, a lot of uh, corporate oversight probably should be there. And, you know, onboarding a new vendor can, can take some time. Okay. So before any large business will do business with somebody else, a new supplier, they have to get lots of information on a small scale here in my business, for example, we've got to get, you know, usually a, um, an agreement in place. We might have to get like the W nine in place for tax return information. And then whatever actual facilitation information we need to do business, we'll have to do that as well. You know, for bigger businesses, it goes up, you know, they could have specific, in this case, licensing requirements. They could have to have certificates, insurance. Um, you know, obviously if IBM doesn't want to get caught doing some business with somebody who's not a uh, professional, so that could definitely be a big concern and they definitely want to, uh, uh, whenever possible, ensure that the, uh, uh, they want to ensure that the, um, vendor that they're doing with is, is certainly of quality and of, uh, of meeting their specific criteria. Okay. And so what they will do here is, uh, the buyer will then carefully check those different documents and then maybe even pull records from other places, better business bureau done in Bradstreet. Uh, I just did some business with Apple, nothing big. I signed, you know, I was helping a client get an Apple developer account and before they would approve the developer account, they actually had to go and pull the records from uh, D and B done in Bradstreet, you know, verify that the business was in, in business. So, I mean, this isn't that uncommon to want to verify a person. Okay. And this could take time. Um, I can tell you for our business, we are actually trying to get approved to do some work with the, uh, a federal government agency. And it took six months to get all the necessary stuff, uh, figured out, approved and with the right people to ultimately get the decision to, uh, to move forward here. Okay. So that definitely can take some time. Okay. And, um, kind of serving other large businesses here, it routinely can take two, three, four months. So again, this isn't that uncommon. Federal government probably is a little bit longer than most people, but you know, it, it's not uncommon for these things to take some time to get processed. Okay. And so it's slow, it's costly. I can tell you as the guy who's had to go through these before, it can really try your patience. Um, but you know, again, it's a necessary tool uh, if you want to do their business and you want to work with a big company. Okay. So, with this particular um, project, what they wanted to do here was try to speed up this process. And how can we kind of improve this process using blockchain and, you know, take it from being months, maybe down to days or even instant. Okay. And so uh, they created this project, went live in 2019, and the vendor approvals rely on lots of different components here. And uh, what's kind of cool with this is that you kind of... Um, you know, sign up, you get verified, and then that information is made available to other merchants in the future. Okay. And so if you think about it normally, you know, if you want to work with a couple of different people, well, every seller then has to kind of, you know, go through that same process, get a rekey in that data to every buyer, a lot of paper shuffling back and forth. What they really wanted to do was kind of create one single verifiable company record stored on a secure blockchain, where then ultimately a buyer can look up that information and know because it's through the blockchain and through the work of uh, uh, Chainyard that that, ver ver that that vendor is legit and uh, meets whatever qualifications and things are uh, necessary to be able to do business. And you could have, for example, different types of vendors inside of uh, Chainyard, you know, so you could have particular, you know, a single vendor might be enabled to do work with federal government, but, uh, you know, maybe not uh, do work with private government. You know, and then at some point, maybe you could append that record, supply the additional information and get cleared to work 
with that, uh, uh, with that uh, private business or whomever you might want to work with here. Uh, but the point is we kind of go through one central entity that's utilizing this blockchain technology and then the different, uh, you know, kind of companies that we want to work with, they can pull the records in this case from Chainyard. And so they've had several different businesses sign up, Anheuser-Busch, InBev, Cisco, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, JetBlue, Lenovo, and others. Uh, and they're starting to see some better buy-off here, as well as uh, in other uh, types of industries too, packaged goods, electronics, logistics. And the idea being, if you want to do business with Anheuser-Busch, you kind of get verified and set up through Chainyard, and then Anheuser-Busch will pull that record down. And as long as you have the necessary you know, qualifications, um, Anheuser-Busch will see that in your record and know that they can you know, do business with you. They can pull down that information. So trust your supplier uh, proposes a pretty compelling value proposition. Buyers and sellers can save time and money and keep their supply chain humming with a single repository of accurate, verifiable data that once I get signed up and I want to go do work with another customer, you know, if they're also utilizing this, uh, this blockchain and utilizing Chainyard, they'll be able to pull that data down quickly as well. All right, so let's go ahead and have a review question here. Which blockchain platform is the most common for private internal projects? So what, uh, what would I want to use for my internal projects here? Now, the correct answer would be a non-public blockchain. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum are both public blockchains projects. You could certainly do this for an internal project, but it would not be best because you're going to be dealing with all of the typical headache that comes with a public blockchain, including massive swings in valuation. So it's not that you couldn't do it. They would not be ideal, uh, either one of these products. Okay. Hyperledger Fabric, you can run this internally. And the same with that Hyperledger Bisu product. You could run that internally as well. And uh, you can get all the benefits of blockchain technology without having to deal with all of the public, um, the public uh, technology like Bitcoin or Ethereum and, and all of the uh, stuff that comes along with utilizing those two specific. Okay. And I'll also point out these are permissioned and private networks. So you can control ultimately who has access to it. And so your information can, you can keep some of the reins on your information. All right, let's go ahead and talk through some public blockchain examples and try to understand some different ways where public blockchains, and these are going to be, for example, like our Ethereum and like our uh, Bitcoin, um, what, how and where these particular products are being used. Okay. So I've got some examples here using uh, some public blockchain. Uh, and frankly, the best example of public blockchain are going to be cryptocurrencies. But beyond that, though, there are some other pretty interesting examples as well. We've also got this thing called NFTs, non fungible tokens, where you can use and create and exchange and trade digital artwork uh, and more. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to say on a public blockchain, the best example is going to be your cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum, and using those as a, uh, I'm hesitant to use this term, but you know, like as a, as a exchange of value, financial security trading, very similar to how you would either train foreign currency or uh, how you would train financial instruments. But again, they're not financial instruments. Um, so I'm using that term very, very, very loosely. Okay, so there are several different organizations that are exploring how public blockchains can be used for payment processing. One such company is Crypto.com. And what they've created is a credit card system that uses and leverages existing credit card networks here. And you could basically get a credit card that is hooked up to your Ethereum or Bitcoin wallet. And when you go to your favorite retailer or buy groceries, you swipe your credit card, it's deducting money from your crypto account. Uh, and this really kind of, let's say, turns the page on a big real world issue with respect to crypto. How the heck do I actually use it? Okay. And still very, very much in the pilot stage here. Um, but uh, you can go and check out crypto.com and you can see some of the different credit card offerings they have. They have several different types, including cashback cards and different cards with different incentives for you to consider. There are groups that are Utilizing blockchain for file storage, uh, specifically SIA and Filecoin. These are decentralized storage platforms where you can physically store files like your pictures, your music, your databases, your spreadsheets, rather than in a service like Google Drive or SharePoint or OneDrive, you can literally store them in the blockchain, which then would make them digitally redundant and distributed across the entire blockchain, across multiple different nodes. And you could just pay them a small fee 
and you can have your data stored in that blockchain. Um, what it does is it actually distributes those files to people all over the world. Uh, people who maybe have extra hard drive space, they can rent their space out to SIA or Filecoin uh, where we can, you know, partition off part of their hard drive. CM Filecoin will fill it up with files. Those files are encrypted. So it's not like you can look at those files that are being stored there. Um, you know, in the same way that a landlord might rent out a room and, you know, you can use that room however you want. And it's got a lock on the front door. It's the same way here. And, uh, you get paid for those, uh, those files being stored on your computer. Okay. And yeah, you know, I personally, I think I'm going to keep my files in SharePoint and OneDrive for the foreseeable future, but, uh, pretty interesting with respect to how that can be used. There are several different organizations that are exploring how public blockchains can be used for management of real estate. Um, you know, currently there's no central, let's call it database of real estate here in the United States. Uh, what I mean by this is, is that like every county for the most part has their own set of records with respect to land parcels. And if you want to go check something in San Bernardino County, where I live, you're going to go have to go to that county website or that county uh, registrar and go find that information. Likewise in Los Angeles County or wherever you happen to, to live. Okay. And, and this is a huge part of any real estate transaction is clearing escrow and title and ensuring that the person selling you the property has the rights to sell it. Okay. Imagine though, we had a common database of property ownership around the world and, you know, kind of buying and selling real estate could be as simple as buying and selling anything for that matter. Okay. And we could have a central repository that would tell us, you know, who are the owners, the tenants, the operators, the lenders, the investors, the service providers, the utility companies, the lien holders, the debt holders, um, across these different, uh, parcels, you know, and it could make something like checking the providence of a, of a piece of land very quick and very simple and very, very easy. Okay. And so with respect to this, um, you know, I think it's really kind of compelling, uh, that, uh, you know, this could make, you know, kind of clearing deeds and transferring of land really fast and simple and easier. Uh, and this is a real thing. I mean, a lot of people, you know, escrow can take 30 days or longer sometimes, and this could basically make it happen almost instantaneously. And, you know, a lot of real estate transactions have conditional clauses that have to be executed, you know, or done, you know, like inspections as an example, as the one that immediately comes to mind, the appraisal is another example there. Well, imagine if real estate transactions were actually incorporated through a smart contract, you know, where we could set up a purchase sale agreement. And as long as the uh, title clears, the appraisal comes back and the uh, inspection comes back all clean, you know, we can essentially make this uh, land transaction happen almost instantaneously. I don't have a good example of companies I can point to at, uh, that are doing this. this is more hypothetical, uh, but I will point that there are several different white papers and case studies that have explored what this might look like in all practical purposes. Okay, there's also other organizations that are attempting to do this with respect to digital identity. Okay, uh, there's a group here. They're called Civic. Okay. What civic does is that they have created a, um, a system where you can kind of have a central digital identity. And, um, you know, if somebody needs to verify who you are, you know, for like signing up for, um, let's say insurance services, or they need to verify that you are the correct person for opening a bank account, you know, they can utilize the civic identity ecosystem that, uh, that is blockchain based when they pull up Steve's record, it would be a central record of everything about Steve. Okay. And then kind of once we're signed in here, we can use this as a way of signing a contract, purchasing goods online, signing up for websites, medical records, and more. But we've got this kind of centralized digital identity, you know, that's a combination of everything from, you know, let's just say your financial records to your personal records, your medical records, and more that would be verifiable to, and, and allow you to be able to access and easily share this information with third parties. Now, obviously there are some pretty big ethical concerns here, and, uh, there are certainly some, uh, major, um, issues around privacy and, and data breaches and stuff like that. But, you know, something like this could be really cool and, and, and take the time that it takes usually to be able to process, uh, an application down, just verifying people very similar to what we spoke with uh, earlier with the chain yard and that vendor management, um, you know, it can take this process down pretty quickly and pretty easily. And from, you know, potentially days or weeks, you know, down to practically instantly. Let's go ahead and have another review question here. 
What blockchain technology would you use to sell one of a kind digital assets and creative works? Okay, so the correct answer here is going to be non-fungible tokens, which we'll talk about more here in a moment, which is an example of public blockchain technology and is warranting its own conversation. Uh, and so we'll explore that here in a moment. Proof of work and proof of uh, stake are methods of confirming transactions in blockchain, so they're not relevant to this, uh, this question, anything that's a made up word. Uh, so the correct answer here is gonna be that non-fungible tokens. Now speaking, let's call them digital collectibles, okay? Uh, the word fungible, when something is non-fungible, what that means is that it's unique, it's serialized, it's one of a kind. Uh, think about money in your wallet. You know, is there any distinguishable difference between one $10 bill and another $10 bill? No. For all intents and purposes, they are the same thing. And, and for your purposes, whether you spend one or the other uh, really won't make a difference. Yes, there is a serial number on it, but uh, they have the same intention in purchasing power. Okay. With a non-fungible token, it's a collectible art piece. Think of it as a, you know, kind of a digital representation of, um, you know, a Jackson Pollock painting, there's only one of them, or a Hognes Wagner baseball card, or a King Griffey Jr. baseball card for that matter. It's special, it's its its own thing. Well, an NFT is a digital version of this. It's something that is stored and recorded in the blockchain, um, and you own it is probably the best way of describing it, okay? Uh, and you could sell it, you can trade it, um, you can give it to somebody as a gift, and it has value in and of itself. Now, NFTs have become very popular in the last couple of years. Uh, it's been around for probably about three or four years now, but it pretty much started growing rapidly in 2020. And in 2021, it grew a ton. 2022 is on track to uh, beat the 2021 record. Although at the time of this recording, I will point out the crypto markets and the NFT markets have drastically cooled down. So there's all different types of NFTs, um, you know, uh, but they're all ultimately blockchain technology and they're all ultimately stored on some blockchain, most commonly stored on Ethereum, okay? Now, what's interesting about this is that NFTs are like, you know, it's the best way I could describe it as like owning a digital baseball card. And I own that card. I don't necessarily own the copyright or the IP associated with that baseball card. I just have a copy of that car. And you should think of them really kind of as being some sort of proof of ownership. Uh, and it doesn't really kind of give you any specific license to use, sale, display in anything other than the fact that you own it. And there have been plenty of examples of different NFTs that have sold for some pretty big money uh, over the last couple of years, you know, from uh, Jack Dorsey's first tweet uh, selling for millions of dollars and more. Uh, if we look at some of the, the, you know, kind of the top transactions here in the last couple of uh, years, uh, it's grown tremendously, but I will point off it has cooled down. Uh, and if we kind of look at this year over year here, uh, and at the time of this recording here, we are on track to exceed 2021, uh, you know, with respect to where they're at. But, uh, you know, it, it, the market itself, at least at the moment, just uh, due to worldwide financial issues is, is kind of contracted. Uh, overall, I would say the crypto market compared to its all-time high in 2021 in November, uh, it's about half of where it was. Okay. Now, uh, where are NFTs used? Well, I mean, they're really kind of used everywhere. Uh, biggest markets are North America uh, and Asia, followed by Western Europe. And uh, for the most part, uh, people are buying these in the hopes that they will go up in, uh, in value at some point into the future, okay? Uh, and, you know, the biggest ones that are out there are usually around artwork. You know, the, uh, um, the Board Ape Yacht Club, the Crypto Kitties, those are the two that immediately come to mind. Some of the first generation of those NFTs are selling now for millions of dollars as kind of let's call them internet historical artwork. Um, you know, it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens here in the next couple of years. Uh, the two markets that are worth at least taking a look at, uh, and by no means is this an endorsement, but OpenSea is the biggest and they sell all different types of NFTs, collectibles, uh, art, music, more. Okay, those are your big ones that are out there. Uh, the other one that's also kind of interesting is NBA Top Shot. And this is an officially licensed product from the National Basketball Association. And you could buy what they call uh, memories of the best, you know, basketball games that have occurred. LeBron James dunks, uh, you know, uh, things of this nature from uh, a variety of different uh, uh, years of, of the NBA's history. 
And again, the best way I can think of it is like these little digital memories, which are like little tiny videos. It's like having a digital trading card, you know, similar to what you would get from tops or, a, uh, you know, something out of a cracker jack box, you know, that you can then, you know, own and trade and share with you. So let's go ahead and have one more review question with respect to NFTs. What rights are established when you purchase and own an NFT? Okay. So go ahead and think about it for a moment. So the correct answer here is uh, nothing. It's just a proof of ownership is the best way of thinking about this. Okay. Uh, when you own an NFT, it does not provide you exclusive ownership and utilization. Okay. So you don't, you're not the only one typically with some of these bigger NFT projects. They will mint sometimes hundreds or thousands of them, just like with trading cards. You're not the only person to have that Ken Griffey Jr. trading card. Lots of people have it. However, they can be serialized and some can be more valuable than others. Okay. It does not give you in most instances, copyright or trademark. It does not convey, um, you know, ownership of the intellectual property generated by that NFT. It, it remains with the artist in almost all circumstances. Okay. Uh, ownership and only in your country. Okay. Um, I kind of made up that response. I don't really know. Uh, I, I really don't think it would apply here. If you own it, you own it. It would not just relate to your country, but I will point out with these NFTs, uh, they can be owned worldwide, but, uh, basically just think of it as like, you know, if it's a, if this is a trading card, for example, you own this one, you physically have it, but that doesn't mean somebody else doesn't own something very similar. All righty, folks, let's go ahead and, uh, we're going to take a break here. And then when we pick back up, we're going to go ahead and talk about some examples of using public blockchain transactions. We'll explore how we would leverage and utilize Bitcoin as an example uh, and how, you know, kind of a standard Bitcoin transaction would go through. Uh, and today, specifically taking a look at uh, some of the accounting principles of how cryptocurrency is leveraged inside a business. I'm going to share with you some insight provided by a recent PricewaterhouseCoopers report on some of the accounting treatments of uh, crypto. Okay. And then from there, we'll talk a little bit about cryptocurrency and taxes, and then we'll finish with how you can get started with utilizing cryptocurrency and public blockchains for whatever purposes you might want. Thank you so much for being here, folks. Stay with us. We have lots more great content coming your way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for attending our presentation and podcast for today. As a reminder, you can check out cpetoday.com for all your continuing education needs. We have courses on every topic you can think of from accounting to audit to ethics and regulation and more. Everything you need to know to stay relevant, current, and up to date with the profession. Again, check out cpetoday.com. If you're a new watcher or listener to the CPE Today podcast, again, we offer you a free course and a free credit for you to try our services. Pick the podcast of your choosing and use coupon code one free podcast at checkout to make that purchase free. If you enjoyed our presentation, please consider connecting with us on social media and let us know what you think. You can find us just about everywhere at CPE today, uh, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. And please consider subscribing to us wherever you happen to receive your content. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and others. We'd love for you to leave a review and let us know what you think. It helps new listeners and watchers find our course and content. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you for being in the office, and we look forward to seeing you back here soon. Take care.